gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the grace that you can just continue to pour out through this epistle. Grateful for the opportunity that you've given us to come together and feast upon your word. I ask that you would filter out all the foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Hope everyone is doing well. Just uh, wanted to point out here before we got started, uh, there's a reason why uh, I'm walking around with whiskers and haven't shaved and that's because I stopped shaving because my old film crew and I are getting together and we're going to try to make a a short Christian film that has to do with the rapture we're hoping everything will go okay and and this will be available for viewing sometime around the end of August so don't expect some Hollywood blockbuster here but you know, uh, my in my part in this, my intention is to try to to get some relevant uh, points across as it pertains to uh, the subject of the rapture. So we've been studying together in the epistle to the uh, Romans, verse by verse, and in our last study together, we had just started to look at chapter fourteen. Now, the, the author uh, is not Paul, but the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the sovereign God. We had 11 chapters of doctrine. And if we are not established in that doctrine, folks, the rest of the chapters, uh, the rest of the epistle makes no sense. And we've spent some time dealing with uh, presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, which uh, is not giving up something, but accepting from the hand of God what He has given us, doing all things without murmurings and disputing, recognizing that it is God who chose us, He called us, He predestinated us, He justified us, He glorified us, He made us righteous in Christ. We stand before Him without spot, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. In the twelfth chapter, we looked at our accepting from the hand of God what he has for us, doing it uh, without just murmuring and complaining, but with thanksgiving. In the thirteenth chapter, we looked at the fact that God has put the authorities over us, whether it's the boss on the job or the head of the nation in which you live, that there's no authority but of God. I accept from him that he has placed over me the authorities that are over, over me. And, and now we are looking at a chapter that deals with personal convictions. This is not a chapter on Christian liberty. This is a chapter on scruples. There are things which are manifestly apparent and openly wrong. We, you know, murder, lying, and so on and so forth. But, but there are many other Christian convictions which are simply just that, personal convictions. I spent some of my early Christian life uh, in, the, in such a, an environment as as that where where that movies were wrong you know and and playing poker was wrong and i began to question those things there are many different convictions among christians that are are really inconsequential as far as god's word is concerned they don't fall under the category of doctrine is is what i'm trying to say they're not manifestly wrong, but if you consider them to be wrong to you, then they are wrong. And we'll look at that as we go on. And so the chapter begins that we are commanded. It's a, it's a present 
imperative. We are commanded to constantly welcome the one who is weak in faith. And the one who is weak in faith is the one who only eats only vegetables. He refuses to eat meat. Now, if you've uh, followed this channel for some time, it shouldn't come as any surprise. I don't believe what many of the modern commentaries say, that, that Paul here is dealing with a problem that existed in Rome because there were Jews there who wouldn't eat pork or other kinds of meat. Or there were people there who, who wouldn't eat meat because they knew it had been sacrificed to idols, because that comes up in Corinthians. And there's others who suggest that, well, really what the Holy Spirit's talking about here is, is those who go to excess. And I adamantly disagree with that. I believe this book, when it says that it is the doctrine of devils and demons to forbid the use of food and drink. God has given us all things richly to be enjoyed, and there's, there's many a Christian who says it's absolutely unchristian to drink. Well, it is absolutely unchristian to get drunk, and, and, and drunkenness is not part of this chapter. It's absolutely clearly apparent in the Word of God that drunkenness is sin. But that doesn't mean because someone goes to excess that you, you throw out the product. Bear in mind, it's, it's God's word that said that those who are speaking lies and hypocrisy and doctrines of demons are commanding not to eat or drink certain food. And you have no right to do that. And from that standpoint, many have taken this chapter to deal with Christian liberty. But Christian liberty, uh, as defined biblically, is not the process of this chapter. The purpose of this chapter, folks is to show that a person can have a personal, they can have personal convictions. I, I am not telling you that you are not to believe that it's wrong to use alcohol. I am telling you that it's biblically wrong to command another person not to use alcohol. Okay? Or play golf, or hunt Easter eggs, or, or put up a Christmas tree, or any other thing that's included in those long lists that Christians carry around in their heads. The church asked me once to uh, teach a Bible class, and they had a, they had a three-page document that they wanted me to sign, where th there were things in that document that I, I have to agree I never used, like, you know, like lipstick and fingernail polish, you know, I didn't use those anyway. And there were other things in that document that really bothered me. I couldn't sign that document. You know, I wasn't to bowl. You know, and, and I I just learned to bowl. I mean, I had a good bowling score. I was getting up to about 68, 70. And here it said, I can't bowl, and I can't go to movies, and I can't wear lipstick, and I can't wear fingernail polish. Three pages three pages and I said if I sign this if I sign this document then I'm denying everything that I've ever believed is true about God's Word folks it is wrong for you to say that it's wrong for a Christian woman to wear lipstick it's not wrong for a Christian woman to say I believe I shouldn't wear lipstick it's wrong for you to say that no Christian should ever go to a movie. It's not wrong if you have a personal conviction that you shouldn't go to a movie. And so we see in the text, he that is weak in the faith, welcome, but don't welcome him to arguments about personal convictions because some Christians believe that they can eat anything, that they can drink anything. I find it interesting that the scriptures indicate that that's the strong guy. And if you want to be on the strong side, clearly that indicates he's the strong one. The one who is weak is the one who restricts what he eats and drinks. But clearly God has received both, says the text. 
he loves one as much as he loves the other, and we should and we ought to welcome them. You know, wel welcome them as members of the body of Christ. Don't let the one that eats look with contempt on the one that doesn't eat. You have no right to do that. Neither don't let the one who refuses to eat judge him that eats all things. For him God has received. God has received him. Okay? Clearly, the one God has received is the strong one. The grammar argues that the one God has received is a strong one. The weak ones should not judge the strong one because God has received him and you have no right to judge him. You know, look at that guy. You know, he's riding his horse on a Sunday. And now we got to hold a special prayer meeting for Steve, you know, with tears in our eyes, you know, to get Steve redeemed again. And that, folks, is not biblical. You have no right to do that. Please don't misunderstand me. This chapter is not an argument against Christian conviction. This chapter is an argument about forcing those convictions on others, judging others based on those convictions. That person thinks that you can't go fishing on the Sabbath and be a Christian, and that's, well, just stupid. You have no right to do that. If they have that conviction, bless their hearts. If you have a totally opposite conviction, bless your heart, and neither one of you should judge or look with contempt on the other. That is what, practically what the whole chapter here is teaching. It's amazing how much time the Holy Spirit has devoted to this subject here. Practically the whole chapter. So it must be important. Who are you that judges another man's servant? That person is not your servant. Okay, that person is Christ's servant. The other man's servant in verse 4 is the strong one. Normally it's the weak that judges the strong. Not always. Someone has a conviction that Christians shouldn't smoke because they don't smoke. You'll notice that most people who tell you you ought to stop doing something or, you know, usually it's, they don't have a problem with that. It's only the stuff that they don't have a problem with. They won't, they won't talk about the stuff that they have a problem with. That's kind of rare. The strong person normally wouldn't judge those that are more likely to judge them. They normally would argue with them. You know, like, look, you, don't you understand Christian liberty? Don't you realize you're not under the law, but under grace? And so they would dispute with them. And it, it is not your responsibility to argue someone out of a personal conviction. You know, now, now these are only convictions folks, in areas of, of what I would call of no consequence. So if you have a personal conviction that murder is, is, is fine, well, you and I are worlds apart. There are areas of Scripture where there is absolutely no argument. This chapter, in, in, in fact, all of the chapters we've been studying here recently, 12, 13, and 14, are dealing with those who are members of the body of Christ. We're not looking at fellowship between those who are redeemed and those who are not. When it says, let not him, that's a Christian. That's a member of the body of Christ. In verse 5, one man esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Those are Christians. They're members of the body of Christ. We're not in, in any of this chapter looking at those who are not redeemed. Who art thou that would judge? Only the weak judges. The strong man looks with contempt. He has no right to do that. Neither does the weak man have the right to judge. For in either case, they don't stand or fall to you. They're Christ's servant. 
That's what the text says. Not your servant. To his own master, he stands firm. The word there in the Greek is related to the word persevere or false. Yea, he shall be holding up. For God is able to make him stand. And the text says, that's the strong man. We're still in that context. For God has the power to make him stand. But it's a different word for stand. Uh, the word is histomy in the Greek. It's God who places him firmly where he ought to be placed. I think that's marvelous. God has put him where he ought to be. Not because of his convictions or lack of them, lack of convictions. Not because of his great understanding of biblical theology, but because God has established him firm. One man, again we're looking at Christians, one man esteems, the word is, is crino, uh, crino for judge, one man judges one day above another, another man judges every day alike. Let every man be absolutely persuaded in his own mind. Even though we might think their arguments don't make a lick of sense. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. That's the phrase that most people forget. Some are not fully persuaded in their own mind. They just believe what they're, they've been told. You know, you don't do anything on Sunday, you know, you don't play rummy, you don't smoke, you don't go to movies, you don't go, you know, whatever. You can say no Christian should do this or that or the other thing when, you know, you haven't spent time in, in serious study to be fully persuaded in your own mind. The same applies to your sense of liberty. It's it's because of the strong and the weak that people call this 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 chapter, uh, you know, chapter on Christian liberty. Even the you'll see that even in, in as subtitles and in, in most of your translations. But Christian liberty deals with the fact that the law has been fulfilled for you and that you stand in Christ Jesus redeemed and you're free from the law. It's these are doctrinal issues. You know, free from constraint, free from condemnation, free from judgment. That's doctrine, okay? But here, the chapter is dealing with personal convictions. But there's a, there's a horrendous difference between believing you shouldn't go to a movie and believing that you shouldn't train to be an assassin. And the difference that we're looking at here are things where God has said he gave us all things richly to be enjoyed and that we should not be commanded not to use meat or drink because God has freely given it to us and it is sanctified by his word and by his grace. So that's why I call these personal convictions. But if you, if you believe that by going to a movie that you're going to go to hell, now we're talking about doctrine, okay? not personal convictions. Now you've added something that is not in the context. It, you know, if you just leave out going to hell, if you have a conviction that Christians shouldn't go to movies, I understand that. But if to that conviction you add doctrinal error, well now I believe there can be some dispute about the doctrine. Are you following me here? Huge difference between, you know, believing a Christian shouldn't play baseball on Sunday and believing that a person who plays baseball on Sunday is going to hell. It's like the Holy Spirit anticipated Christians saying by the time that they reached this chapter, yeah, I know we're not under law, but... And then the arguing and the disputing and the quarreling and stuff begins. 
if you're firmly convinced in your own mind you're you're not going to fish on Sunday, that's great with me. Okay, I don't have a problem with that. Just don't say that one who does is going to go to hell because now we're in a doctrinal dispute. And the scriptures declare, take heed unto doctrine, for in so doing you shall deliver thyself and them that hear thee. I can't give you one verse, not one, of scripture that says that it's wrong for you to believe that you shouldn't drink. But I can give you verses of scripture that say that it is wrong for you to believe that if you drink you'll go to hell. Now we have a doctrinal dispute. In this chapter, we're not looking at doctrine, but personal convictions. The word does not say don't drink. It says don't get drunk. I was helping uh, pound fence stakes uh, once on a Sunday. You know, we're just about the entire crew was, you know, was drinking Coors Light at 1030 in the morning. You know, and some fellow, you know, said to me, he said, you know, you don't drink because you're a Christian. I said, absolutely not. I have absolutely no conviction against drinking. He said, well, why, why aren't you drinking a beer? And I said, I don't want to act like you do when I've had two of them. And I, I thought he was going to pound me. This was a, a man, though, of deep conviction, an absolute gentleman until he had, had a couple of beers, and then it was kind of embarrassing to be around the guy. Folks, I don't have anything against drinking. I do have something against anything that would control me. The Holy Spirit says all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And I'm greatly concerned about that. We're not looking at doctrinal error here. We're looking at personal convictions. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. God doesn't want you having a guilty conscience about anything. That's grace. You cannot be fully persuaded, though, in your own mind that playing poker would send you to hell because to be fully persuaded in, in your own mind, you've told me that you've spent time in Scripture. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that not one thing is unclean of itself. Now, bear in mind, you've got to take that in context. He isn't saying that murder isn't unclean. He isn't saying that adultery isn't unclean. That's not what he's saying. But none of these things, like bowling and you know wearing lipstick or perfume or you know movies, alcohol, cards, you name it, you know, you name it. You tell me that, and and I'm gonna. You tell me I can't ride my horse on Sunday, I'm going to ride my horse to church on Sunday. Okay? I believe God gave the fruit of the vine to rejoice the heart and the soul of man. I'm not, I'm not arguing for alcohol or against it. What I'm arguing against is anything that would control you. Or are you trying to control others? That's my only fear. As far as my own personal life is concerned, if, if any one of you can guarantee me that if I drink some alcohol, I won't become an alcoholic, then hey, you know, that's fine. But I don't know that. And so I'm willing to, well, I'm unwilling to take the chance. I think everybody has these personal convictions. And I don't know whether I put myself with the strong or the weak. You know, maybe I'm only marginally strong. Maybe I'm in the middle of there somewhere. I don't know. You know, that's something that you people have to decide as you study this passage of Scripture. He that regards the day regards it unto the Lord. Me personally, I don't set, I don't set Sunday apart as any different day of the week, but many Christians do. And I wouldn't argue with you on that at all. Unless you said, you know, and attached the, uh, the phrase, you know, well, you're going to go to hell you know, to it. 
If you regard the day unto the Lord, that's great. Let, it, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Please don't miss the fact in this chapter that God has received both. Obviously, the weak is as, as important and as precious to Christ as the strong. And I don't know where you put yourself. I don't even know where I put my own self. But the seventh verse is important. Not one single one of us lives to himself and not one of us dies unto himself. Which, you know, we know is not true of those who are outside the body of Christ. You know, man in all of his wisdom and, and uh, all his research and all his brilliance, some of the great minds of history never figured out who they were, you know, why they were here or where they were going. But we, folks, are a body. We are the members of the body of Christ. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. It's a present indicative. Present indicative. Never once were you anything but the Lord's. You belong to Christ. He's branded your name on the palm of his hand. He, he lights your candle. He bottles your tears. He knows the path that you take. And when he's tested you, you shall come forth as gold. He's promised never to leave you nor forsake you. He promised to be with you even to the end of the age. The author and the finisher of your faith. And if these things are not true, well, then I'm wasting my time teaching God's word. What a wonderful thing to know that we belong to our Lord. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.